Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Eric Novak. I'm joined today with uh, Kramer Lindell for our uh, presentation on overcoming troublesome edge break measurements. Just a brief outline of the talk today. We'll go over some logistics on the next slide. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about you know, what is edge break chamfer radii measurements in terms of our perspective. Uh, see why that's important in general and why that's important to you. Uh, then we're going to uh, introduce a, a three-dimensional measurement system for edge break. Uh, talk about uh, the various parameters, how the measurements are made, and then um, go into uh, performance and verification of results. And then we're going to end up with some various uh, real-world edge break measurements so that you can see the system in action on real world parts and uh, answer any questions that you have at the end of the talk. So uh, with that, let's go to the next next slide here. Uh, just so that everyone's aware how we're going to be uh, running the webinar. Again, everyone will be muted until the end of the presentation and we'll try and unmute you one by one. Uh, to let you verbally ask uh, questions that you've typed. Um, if you're having any technical di difficulties, there is a chat window and feel free to type in there and we'll try and respond to that while uh, Kramer, our apps expert, is doing the presentation. Um, all questions should be typed into the questions panel in the webinar. And uh, so you're aware, a copy of this webinar and the presentation will be made available for you it typically takes about a week for us to get the uh, webinar back and uh, online and links set up. So, but that will be made available for you to share with uh, friends and colleagues. And then one last thing uh, to note is through the webinar, we're going to have a few polls. Uh, please, uh, when you see the polling questions come up, uh, you'll be able to select uh, an answer. Uh, we'll give about you know 30 seconds or so uh, to answer each of the polls, but we just want to make sure that we're keeping the talk relevant to you and uh, understanding your perspective. So uh, thank you very much again for attending. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to uh, Kramer Lindell. All right. As Eric has said, has said uh, we'll be talking about edge break today. So I would like to start out by uh, defining it to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so edge break is something that's done on uh, almost all machine parts on any sharp edges, um, like as seen right here, this sharp edge on this uh, on this theoretical machine part. Um, there are a couple ways to uh, break edges, and right here there's a is a chamfer. It's when you remove material from a sharp edge and uh, machine out a flattened part or you can uh, make a rounded edge. So here, material is machined out and rounded. Um, so there are some reasons why this is done, um, whether it's for uh, performance. Uh, edge break has a, a large influence on hydrodynamics, fluid dynamics, and aerodynamics. Um, so performance of blades and nozzles uh, rely on edge break um, uh, quite a lot. Um, edge break is also used to uh, to reduce stress fractures. So sharp edges such as this right here can be the root of uh, stress fractures coming down uh, the edge right here. So breaking these edges um, can prevent that. Another is just basic safety. Um, edges are sharp and uh, many uh, industries see a lot of injuries due to uh, sharp edges. So we'd like to start off um, with a poll uh, about why uh, you all are using uh, edge break, um, just to get a feel for the theoretical room here. Um, so if you could uh, fill out the poll and um, we, can, we can see why uh, everyone's using edge break here. So here on these diagrams, you can see um, certain uh, parameters that are 
uh, measured. Um, All right, so yeah, just very quickly. So yeah, just very quickly, if you could answer, you know, is it a safety concern in your organization, preventing people from getting injured? Um, is it about performance optimization of parts? Or is it about uh, maintaining part longevity and ensuring that no, uh, no fractures or other uh, defects uh, propagate from edges? And that should be long enough, hopefully, for you to answer. We'll uh, close the poll and uh, talk about results in a, in a few seconds after they come in. But uh, we'll go back to Kramer here. Okay, so we still have the poll results coming in. Um, so the, on this, uh, this diagram right here shows a many parameters that are called out in uh, a lot of drawings uh, uh, for machine parts. And many parts have dozens of uh, chamfer and rounded edge call outs. Um, and these are many of the parameters that are called out. Um, and these are ones that we measure with our uh, 4D inspec. Um, I'll go ahead and show you uh, a quick measurement with the inspec here. And this right here is our handheld uh, 3D measurement uh, gauge. Um, you can see there the live video. This is uh, an edge break standard that we had to make. Uh, there was nothing av available on the market. I can show you right there. Um, so we designed this and had a, uh, had a company uh, make this for us. Um, so right here, we're looking at a chamfer. And you can see the flat machined face right there. And so here's the uh, typical chamfer uh, geometry that we see. Um, and we can throw it into our chamfer analysis uh, right here. And this uh, chamfer analysis in our 4D software will analyze all these data points, the millions of data points in this data set, um, to identify this right plane, this left plane, and this chamfer face. And this, uh, our, our software will um, will analyze uh, the chamfer length, the theoretical length um, of this, this left length and this right length as shown in our, um, I could. Go back to here real fast. Uh, this right length and left length that were machined away. This was material that was removed. Uh, and all these other parameters you see here. Um, so here uh, are our results. Um, so we get our, it spits out our chamfer length, this length right here by identifying uh, this plane, this right plane, the center plane, in this left plane and tells you the dist distance from uh, that this plane takes up laterally. So it removes any uh, tilt that the inspect, uh, the, our instrument, add to the uh, part itself, flattens it out, and using the 3D data, um, you can take all these traces and uh, mathematically uh, identify what the chamfer length is, as well as the theoretical lengths of uh, the left and right extended lengths and uh yeah just to uh interrupt briefly here kramer with the poll results thought we'd share those yeah. with folks um so it's a surprising uh almost equal split so uh about 18 percent of folks say that it's primarily used for safety uh, about 15 percent it's a performance concern uh, for 11%, it's part longevity, and then for 42% or uh, plurality of folks, um, it's all of the above. And then we also have 10% uh, of the folks out there who have uh, other reasons for uh, chamfering edges and things. Just real briefly, Kramer, can you explain 
Um, you know, I noticed on your measurement that the uh, part wasn't perfectly aligned in the yes. field of view and there's a little bit of tilt. Does that affect the results at all? No, so you can see here, um, if we go back to our measured, um, was not perfectly aligned, but all we needed to do was put up, put the inspect up to the uh, to the part, and just like a cell phone, taking a picture, point and click, and we were able to do a non-contact 3D measurement um, with a software analysis. It can uh, remove that tilt, flatten out this uh, these measurements, and uh, analyze this data mathematically to give you the chamfer length, the left extended length, or left and the right lengths, um, and all these parameters that we were looking for. All right, so that is how we um, conduct our measurements of chamfers. Um, we wanted to do another poll on um, and figure out how you guys are doing these uh, measurements currently. Um, there are a few common ways to do it with the optical comparators and styli and um, certain things like that. We wanted to uh, know how you guys are measuring this. Um, so if we'll, we'll send out that poll and uh, look at what you guys uh, are using. So right there, I, uh, I took a measurement of a chamfer on the standard that we had made. OK. All right, so we'll wait on those poll results. Uh, we'll give you guys 15 seconds to answer. We're about 70% uh, answered now. All right. I think we have our results coming in now. Yeah, give us a minute to collate the results and then we'll uh, talk about them, Kramer. You want to proceed and we'll uh, get back to that in just a few seconds. All right. Okay. So on our our uh, our standard here, we had uh, a chamfer made on this side. And I can pull up a uh, a slide that might show this a little better than our webcam. Um, so you can see here, um, one side of our standard is a chamfer. The other side is an external uh, radius and two internal radii right here. And everything in this section um, is uh, certified for uh, 40, 40 thousandths of an inch and so on down the line, 20 thousandths, 12 thousandths, and, and so on. So we took a measurement on our uh, our chamfer right here, and we'll go ahead and take a measurement on an uh, external radius and uh, then an internal radius to show you guys what that looks like. And Kramer, right. on the standard, where um, yeah. is that a commercially available standard or... Uh, where does that come from? No, this was uh, there was nothing available on the market uh, as an edge break standard, so we had to um, approach a uh, approach a, a gauge maker to uh, make a make a standard for us, and they use the optical comparator to um, certify the standard, and uh, we've done a lot of work on on these standards uh, to. Uh, and if I understand right, that's. It's EDM'd out of uh, stainless steel. Yep, it's EDM'd. And that it is available uh, with uh, the Edge Break software package so that people can verify results. Yes, um, it's it's available for purchase um, uh, to verify your results and to verify your inspect is uh, getting good data and taking good measurements. All right, thank you. All right, so I can take a measurement here um, on the standard. Uh, on the external radius. I'll go back to a live video here. All right. All right. So and what am I seeing on the screen uh, in terms of the coloration, Kramer? 
yeah, so this is the live video here you see above, above, above my face. Um, and go ahead. And, and that green uh, is um, all the uh, all the field of view that is in focus. So when you see green, that is good. If I were to move out, it turns gray. That is not in focus. Moving into focus turns the uh, field of view green, and that is good. I mean, green means go. When you can see that, you could go ahead and take uh, take a measurement. Um, and I'll go ahead and take a 3D measurement. So there's our measurement of uh, our external radius. You can see the two sides um, of the uh, of the machine part there. You can see the edge broken, and we can throw that into the rounded edge um, software analysis, and that will identify the two planes on either side of this rounded edge. And in the middle of those two planes, it'll find a best fit circle along all of these traces in the middle, and uh, it'll give you a radius of curvature and all the other parameters we're looking at. So um, as expected, we our edge break radius is 0 0.0402 inches, um, which is what our standard is certified to. And it gives you um, the other parameters we were uh, looking for. Uh, as seen back in uh, on the slide here. So all of these um, parameters, um, our 4D software can can uh, tell you just by taking a measurement like that. Uh, just a point and click measurement gives you the 3D data that can um, you can extrapolate all these parameters out of. Okay, and we do have the poll results in. All right. Um, 42% of folks are using visual methods, and typically that will be either an optical comparator or some places will literally just use cutouts of various radii. 15% um, of folks are using a contact or stylus-based system. 8% uh, are using laser line profilers, and 12% uh, of the folks um, are using, or Sorry, 32% of folks are using a different method, uh, which typically could be a hard gauge um, or, or something like that. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the summary there. All right. If you could, Kramer, what, what are the advantages of a three-dimensional method versus a, a 2D trace in terms of uh, user experience? Yeah, so a large... A large part of uh, why our 3D measurements are so um, useful that uh, ours, uh, our measurements are not over a single line. So we can mathematically uh, decide uh, what what the perfect trace would be, what the average trace would be. So if you're using a, something like a stylus, um, a trace, uh, I can make a trace here. Uh, if I drew a trace, if this was a stylus, if I drew a trace that wasn't perpendicular to the uh, axis of curvature, um, I would get a, uh, a radius of curvature that is artificially long. Uh, instead of 40 thousandths like we would expect, it'd be 58 thousandths shown here, because my trace was not perpendicular to um, the edge itself. Uh, if I were to draw more perpendicular, uh, I'd be more accurate. So this takes all the guesswork that any operator would have um, by analyzing it with 3D data. We can mathematically know the exact correct uh, perpendicular trace. Okay. Um, and about how many data points are there in the field of view here? There are about a million data points uh, with this, uh, the, the standard spec that we are using here, shown here, and four million, I guess, four million data points. Uh, for, for this inspect right here. Okay, thank you. So all those data points are used in identifying uh, this plane, this plane, and the the race of curvature in the middle. And that's uh, the big advantage for using 3D measurement instead of just a trace over two dimensions. Okay. Then we can move on to doing a uh, internal radius. 
on this edge break standard. Um, let's get in the focus there. When the green shows up, you know you're in focus. There we go. Let's click this button right here. It takes a measurement. It'll give me, I'll go ahead and be able to go back into your uh, previously measured, uh, previously taken measurements, and you can crop data. I'll go ahead and recalculate the surface. And that gives me uh, a, uh, my data right there. I'll go ahead and put into the rounded uh, chamfer analysis. All right, so again, it's identifying the plans on each side and uh, telling you the race curvature in the middle. And we can... We also go back and uh, set uh, parameters you want. Uh, if you had a pass or fail uh, guidelines in your callouts and you wanted to say, I want a minimum of 0 0.05 um, and say a maximum of 0 0.055 arbitrarily, uh, this would be flagged as red and wrong. Um, and you could uh, quickly know what uh, parts are out of spec. <clears throat> All right, so that's a nice introduction on how to take the measurements. Um, right now, we're going to move into uh, sharing some reliability data we've done on some various parts, right? So, uh, you know, before we uh, get into the specifics of the, the various tests we've done in terms of validation, we are curious, you know, in terms of the confidence that uh, you all as the audience have uh, in your edge break results. And so that's going to lead us into uh, our last poll, I think, here of the, uh, of the afternoon. And uh, that's how often do you think uh, you might be mischaracterizing um, edge breaks uh, that you're sampling in your uh, facility? Is it, you know, pretty much, you know, almost perfectly reliable uh, that, you know, less than one in 10,000 checks might be leading to false positives or negatives? Um, is it, you know, somewhat you know, reliable, less than one in a thousand? Or, you know, are there actual, you know, worries that you might be passing bad parts and failing good parts, um, you know, more than uh, around 10% of the time? Or is it something we've had people, uh, we've dealt with that just, you know, simply aren't sure uh, what the results um, you know, mean to them sometimes, and how reliable they are, because they don't have outside checks. So we give you guys a, a couple of minutes here to, and uh, answer the, the questions, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, performance testing uh, using three-dimensional results and how we're able to actually verify uh, both accuracy and gauge capability in a variety of situ uh, different uh, parts being measured. Yeah. All right, we'll uh, close the poll out and uh, let the uh, camera proceed. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I can take you through what else the, uh, the I can uh, show you what, what we've done. Uh, She's like staring at my phone again. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay, all right. So these are some of the results uh, that we've done from um, some measurements. This is, uh, these graphs are uh, from our, uh, the PSL is uh, polarized structure light, and that's our instruments. Um, our measurements compared to an optical comparator um, on our algebraic standard here. Um, and uh, our R-squared value was 0.9995, uh, uh, versus an optical comparator. So our uh, results correlated very well um, with optical comparator, but our results take about 30 seconds, while optical comparators took about 30 minutes. Um, our standard deviation in multiple trials was about 0.1%, um, and the radius results are linear to about 2%, or less than 2%. Uh, chamfer results are linear to less than 0.5%. Um, going on, we've done a lot of uh, um, a lot of measurements on different uh, standards, on different parts supplied by different uh, aerospace and automotive companies. Um, our uh, percent error standard deviation have been uh, very strong in all, all our parts. Um, especially on uh, larger chamfer and radii. Um, and uh, even on small chamfers, um, repeatability has been very high um, on these counter sinkholes. Um, we've had a standard deviation. Uh, Okay, and we do have the, the polling results in. So about 8% of folks are, I would say, perfectly confident in the results. They're good to within uh, you know, only maybe one error in 10,000. Uh, 15%, one in 1,000. Uh, 25% think about one in 100 are bad. And 10% uh, think maybe one in 10 are bad. Uh, but the bulk of folks actually 43% um, are unsure of or can't evaluate the uh, accuracy of the results. I think that's one thing that this inspect uh, takes away is that uncertainty. You can compare it with our uh, our certified standard here and see the results uh, in three, a three D measurement and be sure of them. And that that's the strongest thing I've seen about about the four D inspect. And so just judging by this, Kramer, it, it can measure uh, chamfer angles and, uh, and lengths on uh, uh, radius parts as well as uh, uh, flat surfaces, right? So on countersink holes? Yes, that's countersink holes, yes. Um, yeah. You know, a straight line edge? Yeah, we can identify the three planes um, of the chamfer, even if it's on a a circular canosin coal like this shown here. Um, we're able to identify the chamfer length still. All right. So normally um, the inspect is used for a uh, uh, as a defect measurements uh, device, um, I could show you what the uh, 3D measurement typically looks like uh, using just a quarter here. Go ahead and go to this. Before we do that, Kramer, yeah. um, could you actually, um, if you have an automotive part. In, yeah, yeah, with, uh, with kerosene. Could we actually maybe show some Measurements on uh, something else yeah, I'll grab that. in our standards so folks can see uh, the yeah. result. So here we have a, uh, a real world part. No. So how, how many uh, callouts would a part like that have? This this part, the typical part I guess would have dozens of callouts um, that would that typically take a long time to measure if you're using any type of measurement device. Um, but we can uh, we can take one measurement right now, uh, just by hand, and let's see. I'll take a measurement on this uh, 
this hole right here. While you're taking the measurement, what types of uh, surfaces can, uh, can be measured? Do they have to be uh, metal? Can they be other materials? Can they be other uh, colors? They can be rubber. They can be ultra-finished metal. They can be carbon fiber. Um, they can be anything but uh, semi-translucent plastic is the only thing that gives us issues with the uh, polarized structured light. The semi-translucent plastic will destroy the uh, polarization of the lights, which is what our measurements rely on. But I think this uh, this light that you can uh, you can see here on my hands, anything that light reflects off of, uh, we can map the th uh, give a three map of the surface based off that. So here we took a measurement um, on this this part right here on this chamfered a uh, hole and we can take a little cross section of that um, and get this this 3D uh, 3D map of that surface with uh, the three distinct planes of the chamfer right here and we could put this into our uh, chamfer analysis um, software and get our chamfer results just like that um, identifies the uh, three planes um, the right chamfer and the left so our chamfer length right here is uh, 24 thousandths and uh, it extrapolates all the rest of the data for the left lengths, right lengths, um, to show you what has been removed. And so the process there you used, so you took the instrument up to the part, you uh, used the live video to get it roughly in focus, yep. took a measurement, and then you went back and chose the area of the field of view that actually had the chamfer surface, right? Yes, so correct. Zoom in. On exactly where the feature is. Yep. So what I was doing here is taking this, uh, holding it up to the uh, the spot I wanted to measure. I pointed it and clicked. I went back to uh, my previous measurements and uh, focused on the part that I wanted to uh, analyze. This small little cropped area you see here, um, and I want to know that chamfer length. So. I, I can see right here, this, uh, that's the typical chamfer geometry, and that's what I want to analyze. And I threw that into the chamfer analysis and it, uh, told me the chamfer length, just, just like that. Okay. And what's the overall field of view? The, it's a third of an inch by a third of an inch. Here. Remove this. All right. And I could uh, show the, uh, just on uh, a 3D map of a simple coin. I'll get it green in focus. So uh, green means good. And I'll take a measurement of that. I'll go ahead and get back to 3D. And so there's a measurement of this surface, um, of the surface of this quarter uh, that I took just by pointing and clicking right at it, right at it. So it gives me the 3D map here of uh, Mr. Washington. And with this 3D uh, data, we're able to uh, analyze chamfers and uh, spot defects and defects. Say I wanted to know yeah. the height of that high material. Yeah. There, how would I, you know, say that was a, you know, something that was, you know, thrown up by a by a defect and it has some raised material. How would I uh, characterize that? Yeah. So there's there's a few ways to do this. We could do uh, we go into uh, the traces view of a measurement. Um, if you want to know the difference in height between uh, the base of this and uh, this peak of his nose right here. Uh, we can highlight this area from here to here 
and it'll uh, the software will tell you the delta z uh, of this uh, feature, uh, which is uh, five thousandths on this quarter. Um, we could also go to I'll go, I'll go ahead and measure a actual pits on a part. Um, show you some feature analysis. So I have a a pit on this part circled here. I'll go ahead and measure that really really quickly. And what is that component? This is a, a, a blade from a turbine. All right. All right. I'll go ahead and... All right. So I was hold it up like this. You can see the uh, the blue LED there. I'll go ahead and take a measurement by clicking this like that. Um, I'll spit out a 3D map of the surface. There we go. And then I could use feature analysis, which automatically identifies features. Um, so anything deeper than uh, 2000s uh, was flagged. So this pit is, uh, uh, is uh, 12,000 steep. Um, it automatically analyzes any pits, scratches, nicks, or uh, dents that are deeper than any uh, any parameter that you set in here. So this one, uh, it gives you its uh, its height, or in this case, its depth, um, which is 12 thousandths, uh, 12 point eight thousandths. Its uh, its area, its volume, its uh, the, the volume of miss missing material. Um, anything you would want to know about any feature. And what if, if it, I had more than one pit within the field of view? Yeah, for instance, if you had corrosion uh, with multiple pits, um, each pit that violated this, uh, this spec that you had set in uh, would be flagged. Each pit uh, would show up as its own uh, uh, feature right here and with its own uh, set of data. It would tell you its height, its uh, area volume, and so on. So it's a it's a time saver um, in that you don't have to measure each pit. You can measure each pit in the field of view with one click of a button. And if you're measuring along a scratch, it can tell you the deepest part of the scratch. Um, you don't have to guess where that deepest part is. Uh, hi, Kramer. This is Edgar, the organizer. Uh, we have a couple questions that I think are really okay. timely right now. Um, yeah. One is, can you show a scan on the textured edge of the quarter? Yeah, we could try. We could try that out. I'd be happy to. All right. Grab this. All right. So I'll use this. Take a measurement there. So, what is the depth uh, range of the inspect instrument? I can show you uh, real quick some real quick some. Uh... Well, I didn't mean to interrupt the measurement. But... Okay, I'll go back. I'll go back to this measurement real, real quick. Results. Uh, so I can I can look at this this area of uh, of good data that we we had and recalculate. So here we can see we just go to traces um, and we'll do we'll do we'll draw our own trace here. Let's see, this is the depth of the cores we're seeing at this angle. So we were at this angle. We weren't seeing. I could set up on a stand. Probably be easier. Um, we we're seeing the depth here, uh, 0.01 uh, inches. So ten thousandths. Uh, going into the depth, we could probably look at it right here. Um, <clears throat> if I was on a stand, uh, 
Well, because the quarter is round, right? Some of the quarter is going out of our depth of focus range, which is about uh, a tenth of an inch or two and a half millimeters, right? That's correct. And so that's, that's why correct. we're not able to measure all the way down the round part of the quarter. Yeah, so that's why you see it. Uh, that's why you see only a section of uh, green here. Green is the focus. So down here, as you go down the corner, it starts to fall out of the focus. And as you come up, it starts to uh, go out of the focus as well. So this green set of data here is uh, is the part that is in focus with that uh, 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 2.5 millimeters of uh, focus. And one of the other questions I think is pretty timely is someone is asking uh, how the data can be exported or saved to a report. If you could maybe explain a couple of those ways for folks. Yeah, so that's another useful um, useful part of our software, useful feature we have. So all of these measurements are measurements down here that you see <clears throat> that we have taken uh, recently. So we go back to our quarter measurement of the feet of the quarter. If I wanted to save this, I could just click on this save icon, this floppy disk, and I could um, save it anywhere I wanted to save it. Uh, in what type of formats? I can save it as a .4D file, which is our own file that you, uh, that we use a lot. I can save it as a .obd, as a, a, a XYZ point cloud. Um, you can export it into um, any other anal uh, data analysis uh, that would accept that. So for CAD comparison? Yeah, if you wanted to use this data for CAD comparison, we can do that. Um, there's software available that allows you to take our measurements and use it for CAD comparison. Um, if you wanted to save a screenshot, uh, say you had, go back to this measurement here, you can save this um, data set, or we could go to our feature analysis. If you want to know, um, if you want to save this screenshot of that this was flagged right here, this, this button makes it simple. You can screenshot it, save it anywhere you wanted to save it. So single button reporting then? That is correct. And we can also save... Uh, this table down here, uh, especially if you had more um, uh, features, you can save this as a uh, .csv file and you can export it to Excel. Um, make, make makes life easy. So Kramer, we have a bunch of really great questions. I just wanted okay. to know if you had any material you wanted to finish up with, or did, should we go straight to the Q and A from here? I think maybe the last thing was. Uh... Maybe, you know, especially looking at that automotive part that you said had dozens of call-outs, um, something like that would be amenable to automation, right? So maybe we... Yeah, so as I was saying, those uh, have dozens of uh, edge break uh, call-outs. So we, our 40 spec is compatible with um, uh, UR3 robot and uh, uh, native to our software. and can be, we can use remote access to um, pair with any other robot. But here's a video of us using our UR3 robot to uh, measure these um, uh, uh, different uh, areas uh, and chamfers using our software analysis for edge break. So you could actually go completely hands off if you were measuring the same parts over and over again. Yeah, if you wanted to increase your turnaround time uh, and really speed up your, your process, um, going, using automation is uh, ideal in, in these cases, especially with so many measurements um, and parts that are uh, identical like this. You can be hands off, let the robot do its thing, and uh, they'll give you pass fail for uh, all these call outs. Great. Okay, so if we're ready then to go to the Q&A, uh, we'll take some of the questions from the question chat box, and if anyone has their hand up, we will try to go uh, live with you if um, if we have that option. Um, is uh, Eric, would you would you yeah. like me to go through the questions? Yeah, so I can start. We did have one actually typed into the the questions dialog. Um, 
which is whether we measure uh, under radius geometries in uh, rounded pieces such as uh, seamless rolled rings. And yeah, we have actually, we can measure the radii um, in, in surfaces like that, say for bearing races or other similar parts. Uh, that is one of the uses of the 4D inspec uh, is the non-contact measurement of uh, various radii on fairly complex uh, parts. Okay, then uh, to go into the uh, chat measurements, um, someone asked and, and Edgar replied, but um, just for the general audience, well, we are a 4D technology is uh, located in Tucson, Arizona. We do all of our uh, engineering and design work here. And uh, another question was uh, asking about the green line in the center of the live display and whether it needs to be centered. Uh, you can actually, uh, one of the advantages of 3D measurements is you don't need very precise alignment at all in terms of your initial measurement. And then with our traces, you can actually draw arbitrary traces uh, wherever you're interested within the field of view. And you can actually draw the kind of green area that does the you know statistical measurements on that trace it can be anywhere along the trace. So there's no need for precise alignments. There's a lot of flexibility uh, for the operator. Uh, another question that uh, came in was, you know, how is this? How can this be deployed? In the in the shop, uh, Kramer. If maybe you could go over the various options in terms of you know how one way use uh, the system. It, you know you've been using it on a kind of a workbench here, but uh, how else could you deploy it in the shop? Yeah. So the most common thing we see um, on a shop floor, uh, one of the big strengths of the inspect, uh, we put this. Uh, you can see my my setup here. Um, is just a, this uh, computer and this inspect. We put this computer on a, on a cart that you can roll around uh, with a battery, uh, a battery pack on the cart, and uh, this take this inspect and you can roll the, the cart and the, uh, and the computer itself around around the shop floor, taking the inspect to the part itself. Um, so you take the measurement uh, that typically takes place in a lab, um, and if you want a 3D measurement, and uh, it allows you to take the measurement to the part itself instead of sending the part out to a lab. Um, and you can also, if you needed uh, put an area where you needed to go upstairs or ladders or in a tight area, such as on a plane wing, um, we have a backpack kit available where the battery is not on a cart and uh, it's in your backpack. And instead of a computer, you have a Surface Pro, a little tablet. Uh, you can have in your hands and you can just wear it as a backpack and uh say go on a plane wing uh take a measurement um things like that if necessary that leads to another uh, question we have which is you know you're talking about using it in different environments how sensitive is the product to uh, vibration yeah the big reason why we can use this handheld like i don't need to have this mounted uh, I can just hold it up to a part and take a measurement is because it is vibration immune um, using our polarized structured light uh, vibration um, isn't a factor for us because we can take uh, 3d measurements with one camera frame and that's something no one else can do but us and is dust or debris a concern no nope, uh, this is a this inspect here is uh, sealed uh, there are no fan vents uh, if since uh, made improvements on that, and it's just a one sealed aluminum case um, where dust and uh, water spray uh, would not matter. All right, Kramer, I'm, uh, we have a question from Clyde. He's had his hand up for a while. I'm going to uh, go unmute Clyde if you are uh, attending still. Um, you are now unmuted, Clyde, and you can tell us what your question is. What is the gauge r, &R on this? So gauge R&R, &R, um, you know, that depends a lot on, you know, well, it depends entirely on your 
on your tolerance. So one of the things we look at is the, uh, you know, Six Sigma variance is something that's independent of that. So if you do a, a three-person trial um, with 10 parts, uh, 10 measurements each part, three operators, we've typically seen using the system handheld that our Six Sigma variance is around uh, 10 microns and uh, using it in a stand is about half that. And then um, yeah, we've done that on a variety of different uh, surfaces and bits. And so you know, somewhere I would say between uh, 10 and 20 micrometers, which is uh, somewhere around a thousandth of an inch um, in terms of the six study variation. Does that answer your question? Yes. In order to really know gauge R and R, we'd have to say, for instance, if we're measuring a given uh, radius and it has a tolerance of, you know, five, ten thousandths or something, and then, then we can calculate it there. That's not, uh, not we haven't really had those tolerances uh, from our customer base yet, so we tend to keep it uh, looking at linearity, uh, repeatability, and then again, on the gauge study, looking at the study variation rather than uh, an actual percent gauge R R algorithm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Clyde, for that great question. I am uh, going to go back to the question list here. We have two questions from Joe. Uh, one was, "How would it do getting normal edge radius around the top of a cylinder?" And also. I also very much want to see the 0 0.005 measured and fitted. Okay. All right. So we want to measure the uh, 0 0.005 on the. Yep. All right. Yeah, and while Kramer's getting that uh, lined up, Joe, um, we should be able to measure uh, the radius geometry almost anywhere. So be at the top of a cylinder or on a, on a side, as long as we have optical access, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, typically, as you see how Kramer measures edge break, coming at a 45 degree to the radius or chamfer surface that we're measuring. And that means we get both the both of the sides and the chamfer or radius all in a single measurement. Let me take that. So while Kramer's uh, showing off actually doing these uh, measurements handheld, typically for, uh, for the measurements, we would actually have this uh, mounted on a flexible arm so that you can have you know, kind of guaranteed uh, alignment of the instrument to the, uh, to the part. Mm -hmm. All right, so there you can see the uh, typical shape of the chamfer there, and we'll throw in the chamfer analysis again. And uh, so we've got our left flank, that 0 0.005, which is what we're certified to, and uh, our chamfer length of 0 0.075, which is what we would expect. Um, the 0 0.05 on the chamfer, 0 0.005, sorry, on the chamfer is uh, uh, referring to the left length here. So that's the uh, that's a small 
uh, the smallest chamfer we have on this on this uh, on the standard. All right, thanks, Kramer. Any last questions? Oh, we do. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, you have a different. Yeah, let, let me assign some of those over to you, Eric. But in the meantime, uh, we have a question from. Uh, let me go back in time uh, to the earlier things. Uh, uh, yeah. So there, there's one question on on cost, and uh, so I'll I'm the technical guy, so I can't give you exact, exact prices. The instrument runs somewhere around. Uh, Forty-five thousand dollars to, to start uh, U.S. pricing. Um, depending on options, uh, you can. And there is actually a big brother with a larger field of view, so that would be the, the minimum price. And then you know, max, max, you're, you're talking um, within the U.S. somewhere around maybe fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so we have uh, several related questions, I think, here. Um, can it measure 0, 0 0.003 to 0 0.015 edge break on titanium? And uh, what is the IP rating? Yeah, so certainly um, 0 0.002 inches starts being actually at a lot of the machining limits. Um, we actually weren't able even to get the gauge maker guys to give us a certified radius below that. We don't see any kind of lag in capability of the, the instrument, instrument, but we've, but actually, we've actually not, not had, had a certified, certified part, part below 005 uh, to certify to. to. But with, with our um, lateral spacing, spacing is somewhere around a one, uh, uh, one and a half, uh, 10 thousand. And so, so you should have enough lateral spacing, spacing. Get a measurement of that size. IP rating of the product is uh, 53, so it is insensitive essentially to dust, and it can handle light water or fluid sprays, but cannot handle any kind of immersion. And, and in terms, terms of, of uh, titanium as hard, again, again we can measure uh, almost any surface. surface. One of the advantages of this product is it can measure. Surface, surface finishes from ultra polished surfaces, surfaces which are nearly mirror smooth, smooth all the way all to things as rough as cast iron, iron uh, all with the same instrument. And, and uh, uh, it has an it auto has brightness an setting, setting to really so almost really no operator intervention, intervention between materials, materials and finishes. So uh, I'm going to give a couple questions directly to Kramer because he's got the stuff in front of him there. Yeah. Uh, what does the stand configuration look like? And yeah. And, yeah. and what sort works. of computer is needed for this? So we are using a, uh, a Dell Inspiron here. Um, we can do a Dell uh, all-in-one computer. And we, we have Dell laptops, or HP laptops. And we have uh, the Surface Pro for... Uh, the backpack kit all but, running uh, windows 10 yeah all, all on windows 10 there um and this is the stand configuration uh that's typical so i can set that up there and this just slips into here and uh, you can move it up and down into focus and out of focus um right here next to it we have a uh, flexible arm um it allows you to uh, move this arm around uh, and then set it into place. Uh, I find that useful for uh, these chamfer measurements that require uh, something at an angle, uh, like 45 degrees, which, which I was doing by hand instead of using this flexible arm. Uh, so there's a, there's a couple different configurations for the stand that you, that you can have. But um, typically um, people uh, use this on, on the cart that we were talking about for the shop floor. Um, sometimes people just use handheld. And this is good for a, a desktop like I'm using right now uh, for, for as a workstation. And Kramer, uh, from the same, uh, one of the same questioners, uh, there was what kind of, what was the calibration process for the equipment? Yeah, so I have, 
we have a calibration standard that we sell um, that's certified by PTB, um, which is a, a treaty equivalent to NIST. So this is a, a certified standard we have. Um, and this has uh, different valleys um, in, inside of it. Uh, I'll try to pull it up here on the, the live video on our software. Uh, and so for calibration, all it is is taking a, uh, a simple measurement. Go ahead and take out my focus aid real quick and set it back in the stand. Um, but go back to my video. So really, um, calibration is about taking a measurement on this piece right here that you see. Um, all right, there we go. Yeah, so I we have a calibration. Calibration screen here. So our calibration screen has these uh, red overlays to match our standard up to, and we might not have a standard on this. Uh, there we go. Okay, and then it's as simple as taking a measurement um, like this. Take a measurement, and it's, uh, I'll line up a little better. I'm a little off the overlay. Okay. All right, so I took a measurement of the, the standard itself, and it tells me I was 0.04% uh, off the certified standard, uh, the certified height uh, that was measured by PTV. Um, you can see the certified height here and the, the, what we measured. So we were 0.04% off um, the known certified height uh, that, that we know the standard is. So that was just the, that was the calibration process right there to know that you're uh, within range and taking accurate measurements. All right, thanks. So I'll uh, address some other questions that come up. Um, one is that uh, one of the um, askers says that their edge break um, specs are based on uh, local limits of radii per region of the edge. Can our software work to such limits? To show pass fail. Um, I believe that what we're doing is it you know does provide that equivalency. But one of the things um, we can work with, as long as we have the data and we do have the trace by trace um, results, we might have to actually add some statistical results on the traces. But that you know if if that's not in there, that would certainly be possible. Uh, someone has asked whether we can measure glass surfaces. If it's highly polished glass, uh, we can sometimes measure deeper uh, defects or scratches on them. And there is actually a video online talking about how to measure shiny surfaces with the inspect. If it's just perfectly smooth glass, typically that's below our noise floor, which is a, a tenth of a thousand inches or about two and a half microns. And so we can measure it, but we don't see a lot because most glass is smooth to the nanometer level. Another question is, can we measure a chamfer that has rounded corners? Um, right now, the software will measure uh, two planes with a rounded edge between or two planes with a, with a third plane in between. Uh, if we have more complex geometries, and we have had that before, where it's a plane and a very small radius and then another plane and then another small radius next to that, we would break the measurement up into sections so that each section of basically three features gets measured independently. And we have done that successfully for customers. Another question, can we measure the ID surface of a pipe um, with a six inch diameter? Yeah, that's no problem. One of the things we didn't talk about, um, this is an optical uh, system, obviously, and you can use fold mirrors, much like the dental mirrors a lot of inspectors already use. So you can make the instrument look sideways, and that's useful for measuring IDs of pipes um, between blades on turbines, things like that. 
So I have a, I have a, actually a full mirror right here that you can slide right into uh, where the focus aid usually goes, and that allows you to see into uh, something like this. I can see into uh, these corners, and so a defects out of line of sight uh, can be visible uh, using a full mirror like this. Okay, and then. Um... You know, I guess the last question here, can it measure uh, diameters um, at 40,000 uh, plus or minus uh, 0 0.002? Yeah, that that's similar to one of the other questions in terms of uh, someone else was asking edges 0 0.003, 0 0.015. Again, our, our pixel spacing is around a, a tenth of a thou. And so as long as we have enough pixels across the feature, they're there shouldn't be an issue with the calculations. Yeah. And real quick, going going back to the uh, chamfer of rounded edges, um, would that was that question asking about uh, extended lengths, or is that a, a different topic? Um, it might be. You might want yeah, to explain I'll, that real I'll quick. Go ahead and uh, touch on that real quick, as we haven't yet. So. Um, right lengths and left lengths here, uh, the removed material, um, are calculated from uh, the end of this plane to where these planes would uh, theoretically intersect. Uh, right extended length comes into play um, when this, this edge is a little rounded, and this plane typically would end right here about, uh, where our data would identify um, those data points as a plane. So then a left extended length and right extended length here would come down and start at the end of this plane. So um, if your chamfer is a little rounded on each edge, uh, right and left extended lengths um, are called out. Uh, yeah, and that was at the request of one of our customers who had both on their on their drawing sheet. So uh, real quickly then, uh, just I think three more questions left. Uh, uh, where does this fit versus vision systems? And is it possible to use the handheld unit without a PC connection, both from, uh, from Bud? So right now it is not possible to use this without a PC connection. The PC is providing both power and the data. So we don't have an instrument that can be completely untethered. Um, that said, uh, the, it's a single gig E cable uh, that connects the instrument to the computer, and that can be essentially any length. But we cannot run completely untethered. And in terms of where this relates to vision systems, in a way, it's approaching um, you know, 3D AOI, or 3D automated optical inspection. It is a, using a single camera frame, much like a 3D, uh, much like a 2D camera, but we actually get the full three-dimensional results. Now, where things fall down a little bit is in the analysis. Um, by the time we take measurements and run through all the analysis, we're somewhere between one and two seconds, and um, obviously vision systems can run much faster because their data is typically much much simpler uh, without all the 3D analyses and fitting. And, and so we can't, uh, a lot of times if you're looking for full part inspection, we've had people marry this with a vision system where the vision system will find defects or areas of interest and then come back with this to quantify each of those areas rather than using this entirely on its own to do automated inspection of large components. Uh, okay, I think uh, I think that we demonstrated this, but uh, can you measure chamfers at angles other than 45 degrees? So the key there is to um, you need to get data on all three faces of a chamfer. So the reason why we were coming in at the uh, that 45 degree angle was to make sure we get data on this top face, the chamfer face, and this um, uh, this right face. Um, 
So the reason why I'm going in at this angle, uh, I'll take this out real quick, uh, is so that I can reflect, I'll show you there, uh, that light can touch all three of those faces. So if I'm coming at, line, uh, at an angle like this, um, the light's not gonna touch that third face. So as long as I can get data um, on all three faces, I can take the measurement. And that said, we can get data typically to about 60 or 70 degrees. So yeah, if you had a 30 degree chamfer, a 20 degree chamfer, or even a 60 degree chamfer, we should be able to measure it. Now, if your chamfer becomes like 70 degrees, where it's nearly, um, where the chamfer winds up being nearly perpendicular to the face, then you know that we might start getting data drop out. Well, probably anywhere 60 degrees or less for uh, chamfer angles would not be an issue. Yeah. Okay, and I want to thank everybody for being really patient. We have gone uh, well over time on this. I think yeah. uh, we've just got two more questions, and that'll uh, finish it for today. Both from Doug, if you're still with us, Doug. Um, can it measure a chamfer that has rounded corners? And uh, I think related or expanding on that, we have a chamfer on a gear flank. Gear flanks are non-planar. Still capable? So the short answer to both is yes. So we can, we have actually measured uh, chamfer angles on hypoid gears, on standard gears, and uh, that's not been an issue. And uh, again, chamfers with rounded edges um, on both sides, uh, we'd have to take a look at that uh, and see how our, we, we do assume a planar fit, but you saw how Kramer would narrow down the region of interest in the measurements after he takes it. And I'm pretty confident we could narrow the region of interest to where the software should work. Um, that would be something we'd love to get a part in. Um, this is a new software capability for us. The product has been out for a couple of years, but this is a new addition. So it's something that, uh, you know, much like the, the standard product roadmap, I, I imagine we'll undergo various iterations and extensions as it gets out there in the field. But please, uh, you know, send us an email at uh, the info at uh, nanometrics.com. And uh, we'd love to get a part in here, show you what we can do. And uh, if we can't do it, if it's strategic, it's something that we certainly roadmap out. We have two software releases roughly every year extending capability of the instrument into new areas. Yeah, and on that note, let's get that final uh, information, contact information slide up on the screen yep. uh, with our emails. Uh, we thank everybody for your questions. Uh, there probably are a few questions that we didn't get to, and uh, we would like to address them offline if, if at all possible. Um, so we'll be getting back to you as registrants, but uh, if you have other questions, you can reach us at the uh, website 40inspect.com or at our our information, our question uh, inquiry mailbox 40info at nanometrics.com. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, thank you, Kramer and Eric, for an excellent presentation. Uh, Y'all be, be safe out there and uh, have a good week.